Hi, my name is Jordan Meyerhofer, and today I want to tell you about a composer you probably have never heard of, but you should. She was a giant in her time, and it baffles me that her name is barely mentioned in history books today, because she truly embodies the meaning of an influencer. Seriously, she had an impact on nearly every composer, and artist for that matter, of importance in the 19th century. So who was this hidden figure? Madame Michelle Ferdinand Pauline Garcia was born on July 18, 1821, in Paris, France, to a family rich with musical talents. She comes from at least four generations of musicians. Her father was Manuel de Popolo Vincente Garcia. He was an incredibly famous tenor, mostly known for his portrayal of Don Giovanni and his Rossini roles. Count Alma Viva from The Barber of Seville was written for him, among other roles. He was also a pedagogue and would teach his own children how to sing, as well as a composer and impresario. Pauline's mother, Maria Joaquina Sices Briones, was also a famous soprano and actress. Both her mother and father are from Spain, but their children were raised in France. Pauline had two siblings. Her brother, Manuel, was the oldest of the three. He was the baritone, a pedagogue, and he also invented the laryngoscope. Her sister was the legendary Maria Malibran, a dominating contralto of her time. She was a household name for her fascinating personality, her vocal technique, her beauty, her stage presence, and unfortunately, her tragically early death. Pauline's upbringing consisted of voice lessons from her parents, piano lessons from Liszt, and counterpoint lessons from Reika, who also taught Berlioz and was close friends with Beethoven. Her father's career allowed them to travel across the world, and when Pauline was just four years old, her family made a visit to New York to perform six Rossini operas in their original language, plus the Mozart's Don Giovanni. It would be the first time it would ever be heard in the United States. Mozart's librettist Lorenzo da Ponte was even in charge of many details of the performance. Her father was, of course, Don Giovanni, her sister played Zerlina, her mother played Donna Anna, and her brother Leporello. It was the beginning of a lifelong history with Mozart, specifically Don Giovanni. Pauline's father died when she was 11 years old, and her sister Maria died tragically three years later. Pauline was 14 years old and had incredibly large shoes to fill. Though Pauline had her sights set on becoming a pianist, her mother pushed her to follow the family's legacy and sing professionally. At the age of 15, Pauline made her concert debut in Brussels with her brother-in-law, violinist Charles Auguste de Berriot. Two years later, just before turning 18, Pauline made her operatic debut as Desdemona in Rossini's Otello in London at Her Majesty's Theatre. Within that year, she toured through London and Paris and quickly made a name for herself. The next year, under the influence of her close friend, Georges Sand, who, by the way, wrote the main character of Consuelo, inspired by Pauline, she married Louis Viardot. He was 21 years older than her, which didn't matter in the slightest. He was a distinguished art critic, publicist, and director of the Teatro Italien in Paris, and he would become her manager and booking agent. The two had four children together who also possessed musical gifts, no surprise there. Three years after marrying Louis, she had her debut in St. Petersburg, where she performed Rossina in Rossini's Il Barriere de Sevilla. In the audience was Ivan Turgenev, a young Russian novelist who would soon become the center of Pauline's love life. By the time she was 22, Pauline had sung in Paris, London, Berlin, Vienna, Milan, Madrid, and St. Petersburg. Throughout her career on stage, Pauline created and originated many roles, and many composers loved writing for her. She had quite a bit of input in what she would and wouldn't sing, which ultimately would destroy her voice in the end and result in her early retirement. But composers respected her opinion regardless of the fact that she was a woman, which is kind of unheard of for that time. She is most notably associated with the creation of Fides in Meyerbeer's Le Prophète, her revival of the role Orphée in Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice, a role which she sang over 150 times, and the role of Donna Anna in Don Giovanni. But she was also well known for her portrayal of Zerlina in the same opera. She would even sing both parts in productions for nearly 20 years. Her range was legendarily wide, and it's disputed whether she was a mezzo-soprano or a contralto, but it was her interpretations of these roles which made her so interesting. She amplified the significance of the soubrette role and showed that it could compete with the prima donnas. Other composers who held her in great esteem were Berlioz, whom she was a close friend and confidant of, and possibly more, Wagner, Chopin, who learned the nuances of Spanish music through her, Gounod, also a possible lover, 
Saisons, who dedicated Samson and Delilah to her, Brahms, who wrote Alp Rhapsody for her in 1869, Robert and Clara Schumann, and Robert dedicated Liederkreist to her, Faure, and many, many others. She was also close with writers, poets, artists, and pretty much anyone who was anyone in the 19th century. She was connected to them somehow and probably had an impact on their work. Most notably, however, was Ivan Turgenev, the Russian novelist and poet mentioned earlier. He was 25 when he first saw her perform in St. Petersburg and was immediately taken by her. Back then, he was a government clerk and an unsuccessful writer, but he was introduced to Pauline after her performance, and the two kept in touch after that. Two years later, when Pauline returned to St. Petersburg, she gave a performance in perfect Russian, which made her a sensation to the Russian public. Ivan left Russia with the Viardos in 1845 and stayed with them in their home or as a neighbor in nearby apartments for the remainder of his life. He became a part of the family, and he would treat the children as his own. He even at one point had a relationship with another woman, which resulted in the birth of his only child, who he would call Paulinette, and he would raise with the Viardo children. When the two weren't together, they would write letters to each other daily, secretly sharing their love for one another in German, a language which Pauline's husband didn't understand. It's actually unclear if he was in on the affair or not, but by the looks of it, he didn't really seem to care. <laughs> Chernigov made a name for himself in the literary world, definitely with the help of Pauline. No piece of his writing was sent to a publisher without the editing and approval of Pauline. She was very much attuned to style, character, and integrity of the piece. He also had written texts for her to use in her compositions as well, my favorite being the operetta Le Dernier Socia, written in 1869. Ivan once wrote to Pauline in a letter, I wish I could spend my life as a carpet under your dear feet, which I kiss a thousand times. You know that I belong utterly and entirely to you. In the same letter, he also thanked her for the fingernail clippings she had been kind enough to send. He loved her until the day he died in her house in 1883. In 1863, at the age of 42, Pauline retired from her stage career, left France, and resided in Baden-Baden, Germany. The Viardos, however, soon returned to France after Napoleon III fell, and she taught at the Paris Conservatoire. It's unclear if Pauline really had intentions on becoming a composer, but she wrote many private pieces for her students and family members with the intention of developing their vocal skills. Her compositional output includes art songs, operettas, and chamber music. She was fluent in French, Italian, Spanish, English, German, and Russian, and her compositions were influenced by all of these languages and styles. Her life was devoted to teaching, and her students include many successful singers, including Desiree Autot, Marianne Brandt, Aglaia Orgeni, and Antoinette Sterling. Her retirement from the stage was by no means the end of her work whatsoever, and she remained a popular figure well after her stage career was over. Socially, she was very much alive, and she always had interesting people at her residence. She loved to show off her collection of musical autographs, including Bach's Schmiechedich, Mendelssohn's 42nd Psalm, and, most notably, Mozart's Don Giovanni score. Her friend Hector Berlioz once wrote about her, To speak of Madame Viardot would really require a special essay. Her talent is so complete and varied. It touches so many points of art and combines with so much science with so entrancing spontaneity that it produces at one and the same time both astonishment and emotion. It strikes and yet it appeals. It overawes and persuades. Her voice of an exceptional range is at the service of the most consummate vocalization and of that artful phrasing of the chant large which has become so rare nowadays. She unites an irrepressibly impetuous and imperious verve with a profound sensibility and with an almost deplorable faculty for expressing immense grief. Her gestures are sane, noble, and true to life, and her power of facial expression is even more remarkable in dumb scenes than in those where she has to reinforce therewith the accents of song. Pauline died in Paris on May 18, 1910, at the age of 88. Her body rests at the Cimetière de Montmartre in Paris. Her legacy today is far too quiet for the storm that she was. She unfortunately lived in a time that technology of recording wasn't available, so we'll never know the sound of her legendary voice. Upon the news of her death, Camille Saint-Saëns wrote, Her voice was of enormous power and of prodigious range, but this marvelous voice, trained to surmount all the difficulties of vocal art, did not please everybody. Hers was not a voice of velvet or of crystal, but a voice just a trifle harsh and occasionally was compared to the flavor of bittersweet oranges. 
It was made by nature for tragedy or epope, superhuman rather than human. Light things such as Spanish chansons or Chopin's mazurkas transcribed by her for the voice assumed a different shape through the medium of her own voice. They became the badinages of giants, but to the accents of tragedy, to the severities of oratorio, she imparted an incomparable grandeur. Madame Biardot was not beautiful. Worse than that, Ari Sheffer's portrait of her is the only one which does justice to this unequaled woman. No other gives an adequate idea of her strange powers of fascination. Her personality rendered her even more captivating than her talent as a singer. Without doubt, her personality was one of the most astonishing I have encountered. Speaking and writing fluently Spanish, French, Italian, English, and German, she was conversant with the literature of all countries, and she corresponded with all Europe. I'm going to link below some of my favorite pieces by Pauline Biardo so you can get a taste of her musical genius. I hope you liked this video and if you did give it a big thumbs up and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!